Where did you go to school? And who is your daddy? What do you think of what's going on right now, mate? These evil little invisible parasites. Satan worshipping Freemason moron. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're not run by factions. Get the fuck out of here! There are much more powerful international forces in play. Is this pink guy? Is this what pink guy is? I don't fucking know what's happening. Please go outside and look at the moon quickly. It's been crazy, guys, but guess what? It's how it is, mate. Mate, because I want to do it slowly. Well, I ain't spending any time on it. Welcome to the Conditional Release Program, a podcast that delves into the nether world of Colts, Crims and Con Artists. I'm Jack the Insider, otherwise known as Peter Hoisted for tax purposes. And I'm Joel Hill, and we are back. We're back. Clip show was a nice break. Putting this show together is such an absolute slog. And while we do love doing it, we needed a rest. I needed a rest. <laughs> I think you needed a rest too. Yeah. But also, what a great walk down memory lane. I actually laughed out loud in the car listening to it. I'm quite funny at times. What can I say? Yeah, we got we got to hear from Eric again. Bless yeah. his psoriatic heart. And he's <laughs> back in this episode finding himself checking gum tree for burial plots. Oh, maybe he could turn Whoa. himself into biosludge and be sprayed <laughs> across the ninth hole at Trump National Golf Course in Bedminster, New Jersey. Really green up those fairways. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, watching Eric fertilize the grass is probably the proudest moment Donnie's had for Eric because there hasn't been many of those. Yeah, not one damned one, you know, poor uh, lad. But he's a good looking boy and yes. we'll leave a good looking corpse. More about that later. Yes. In the meantime, we wish to kick off episode 101 with a few thank yous. Sandy and Sauce, especially. Mm-hmm. It was remiss of us not to mention you on the 100th program. Damn remiss. I blame totally Joel. Great. Whoops. But know in your hearts, we could not have done it without you. Or oh. indeed, any of you who have contributed to the program, given it a boost, or flicked me and Joel's stuff of interest. Yep. Your help over the past two years has been instrumental in making sure the podcast had insights into cookers and conspiracy movements that can only come from tirelessly watching mad people do mad things for hours on end. We truly yeah. appreciate your work. Absolutely. And for someone who absolutely hates watching video content, I can't stress enough how important it is for people to have pointed us in the right direction, to give us all these juicy details and the saucy stories without trawling through hours of rambling content because mm. I couldn't do it. I literally couldn't do it. I probably would have given up by now. Heartbreaking, yeah. And there's just there's a ton of you on Twitter and all sorts of mediums that send us beautiful things and abbreviate videos to two minutes and I yes. fucking love you for doing yes. it. Yes. And yes. we love you all to the bottom of our hearts. Yes. Yeah, we, we did didn't do this in the heart of it. We should have, and we and, love you. And, and speaking of rambling, uh, this is the part <laughs> where we put our hat out and beg for money. Yes, I am once again asking for your financial support on behalf of Joel. <laughs> now, this is a podcast built of blood, sweat, and tears. I, ble- yeah. I cut myself the other day and bled quite a lot. <laughs> and the only way we make it happen every week is a solid stream of adrenochrome. Yep, I did drink it. And it's not bloody cheap. <laughs> you are a tortured child, aren't you, Jack? Yeah, it's actually made me feel older. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Benjamin Button's adrenochrome situation. <laughs> so please consider signing up at patreon.com slash conditional release program. And from five bucks a month, you'll get all sorts of rambling content from us to keep you amused until the end of time. There's tons of it on there. People's Street is great. And speaking of the end of time, it's the end of that and the start of this. A huge week in the conditional release program's weekly news. I didn't actually know about the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne until it became the venue for an anti-lockdown piss-up. Lots of rum and cokes, lots of red flag-waving bogan gronks, pissing all over a monument to those that died defending Australia at war. Yeah, they did urinate quite a bit on the Shrine of Remembrance. What goes in must come out. If you've grown up in Melbourne, it is a, you know, it's a, it, it is a heritage building. It is a really sacred building. And, uh, yes, it was uh, something else just to watch the place being pissed on by mm-hmm. cookers. Yeah, it's not very nice. I think a few people were in the same boat as me, which is sort of lefties who don't have much of a military fetish, but still finding a bit of a moment to be outraged over the desecration of something they hardly thought about until it was just taken over by drunk pedo fantasies with these <laughs> sexually violent hero complexes. And then it was a bit on the nose. I mean, yeah. like, these people fucking Ugly. died. It kind of sucks. Like, not yeah, like I say, not big on the military fetishism, but there's a line. This, of course, was universally condemned, except by cookers, who basically pretend it didn't happen. You know, yeah. they've just got this cognitive dissonance. No, we didn't do it. We were cleaning up the rubbish. Yeah, it didn't happen. Yeah, we cleaned up the rubbish. Yeah, no, it was like totally Antifa. Like, what? Like, they just have no shame. They never take responsibility <laughs> for was, actions. It it's was Antifa urine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Take it down to the boys in the lab. They'll, they'll tell you. Antifa urine. Yeah, there were plants. There were feds. <laughs> Shut up, dick. Yeah, fast forward to last weekend where the shrine was to hold a celebration of LGBTQI personnel in the armed forces. 
past and present and cue the fucking outrage. Uh, the shrine was to be lit up in the colours of the rainbow flag alongside a special last post service at dusk to open a new exhibit which called Defending with Pride, which includes mm. stories of gay and lesbian members of the armed forces over history. Of which there are many. And the lighting of the shrine was cancelled at the last minute yep. due to a backlash from right-wing mouth breathers. And you can imagine how this played out. A statement from the memorial's administrators said, Over several days, our staff have received and been subject to abuse and in some cases threats, mm. Shrine of Remembrance Chief Dean Lee said. We have seen something of what members of the LGBTIQ community experience every day. It is hateful. In place of the lights, a rainbow flag has been raised at the shrine. Uh, a ban on gay and lesbian personnel in the armed forces was lifted in 1992 by the Keating government. But that doesn't mean they weren't in the ranks. I mean, it's like that no. don't ask, don't tell law in the USA. As long as it was kept under wraps, it wasn't enforced. Having to keep your sexuality a secret is a burden nobody should have to bear, especially when they've decided to take up arms, put their life on the line, and potentially die in a pile of mud and blood for the objectives of a nation state. But, you know, that's how it was in the good old days, right? Oh, I love yeah. the good old days. Mm. So recognition for this and the adversity they faced really isn't a big deal. I mean, these people died for our country. Be cool about it. But, of course, the campaign against the lights was kicked off by usual suspect shock jock Neil Mitchell on 3AW. This is like, you know, the, a Melbourne right-wing commentator on sort of drive-time radio who claimed that the rainbow flag was divisive and the lights were just a step too far. To be fair, I believe Neil Mitchell wasn't huge on the fact they were pissing the shrine either, just as a bit of a myth. No, he did. He did come out against that. I he, mean, did, you know, he did. He was, but, he was opposed to urination on the Shrine of Remembrance. So he's quite consistent. But the thing is, like, the campaign against the light has provoked this outrage from the usual right-wing pest and an army of these silent Australians who, through their two cents all over mainstream social media posts, parroted talking points en masse wherever they had some sort of blank online space to pollute with their thoughts. Cookers and Bogans just joined forces to make their voices heard loud and clear and it was painful to read. I would be very surprised if there wasn't a bot campaign involved which was repeating this sort of commentary across social media platforms at the behest of right-wing and religious groups mostly because Ed Coper's book has ruined me. You should read it. It's really good. Yeah, so what's the title of that again, Joe? Uh, Facts and Other Lies. It is highly recommended. We'll it get him on the show at some point. He's Yes, very indeed, good. it'll be on the show at some point. Look, one Galaxy Brain commenter said this on the Channel 7 Facebook uh, page. Totally disgraceful decision in the first place as the shrine represents all those who have fallen representing their country. To have anything done to it in light or anything else takes away the original meaning of the structure. And, of course, who better to decide the original meaning of the structure than John from Werribee. <laughs> Thanks for that, John. We weren't too sure just yeah. exactly what your position was. Cleared it up, cleared it up for us. I was so unsure. So it's incredibly important to note that this is not the first time the shrine has been lit up. So this outrage is bullshit. It was lit up in honour of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, which is a little bit weird, but I guess a lot of these people did theoretically fight for the king and queen of the time when they died slowly in a puddle on a beach. They also lit it up to remember the police officers killed in 2020 by that creep in the Porsche, who I don't want to name or give any airtime to, but was a complete Good. scumbag yeah, and a sociopathic narcissist. Yep. But they also lit it up to mourn the death of assassinated former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. You know, the guys we fought against in World well, War II. not Shinzo, but Shinzo was no, but most you know, unapologetic about most of Imperial Japan's outrages. He was pretty consistent on that, and there was just not a peep about that. Like, And, like, I'm, I'm happy with that. I don't think there should have been a peep about that. I think it was a very respectful tribute. But no Facebook whinging. But now that it's lit up to, remember, gay servicemen who fought for our country and died in the process, it's a fucking outrage. Maybe it's not actually lighting up the shrine that's the issue here. Maybe it's not so sacred after all. Yeah. Yeah, she might have touched on something there, Joe. Look, this is another thing about our walk history that a lot of people have acquired meaning and attachment that actually isn't theirs. Yes, hundred um, <clears> percent. <throat> that they sort of identify with our with our um, uh, return servicemen yep. and women, yep. um, but have no direct attachment to them. That's not to say that those who have got relatives who fought in World War Two or in Vietnam or in World, indeed in World War One, Korea, etc. Any of the any of the major battlefields, and going all the way up to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, that, that that those people who have that attachment there might might sort of understand it a little bit better, rather than this sort of collective roar of "Oh my God, don't dare desecrate the name of the diggers who we don't know." Yeah. Although they just say this sort of stuff in their own image. It's like, whatever I believe in, the diggers believed in, and I'm going to make sure that yeah. their honour, like, you know, it's stolen valour by saying my beliefs are those of the diggers and you should respect them like you respect my beliefs. It's projection exactly right. and it's bullshit. Exactly right. Yeah, it's nasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, anyway, 
Another Facebook comment on Channel 7's post said, Stop making everything about the minority. Can we just go on and live our lives without a sexual agenda? Should be a question mark there, you idiot. No one cares <laughs> what you do behind closed doors. I love where they fuck up fuck you. Three exclamation marks to say... What I just said was damn important. Oh, yes. It's the absolute lack of awareness, yet the stunning display of confidence really sums up the quiet Australian mindset. Uh, the guys who bashed homosexuals to death in the streets over the last several decades, really nasty history of that in Sydney in the 70s and 80s, cared quite a bit of what they did behind yeah, closed doors. they did. to seek them out in the places they congregate and murder them in the dark. Yeah. The law that said they couldn't serve had a pretty central premise. We care a lot about what you do behind closed doors. Closed doors, we simply do as a society, and if yeah. and, and and what should be behind closed doors is immediately pried upon, you know, yeah, 100%. <clears throat> by this sort of commentary, this little loud social commentary. Now, well, this is the thing, it's this kind of like dopey libertarian style deflection. It's just exactly how big it's exercised this arbitrary hatred of theirs of these minority groups by pretending to shrug a shoulder, but then. The moment they're seeking equal rights, they fight tooth and nail about this group that they, you know, care yeah. so little about. Oh, no, I don't care what you do behind closed doors. I'm yeah. just not going to get let you get married. Everybody like, should be treated equally except for them. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, like, the efforts to turn this into a thing have been astonishing. While Neil Mitchell riled at the normies, Avi Yemeni spearheaded the cookie campaign, oh, claiming dear. there was to be a protest held at the shrine, which was the real reason for the lights being cancelled. But uh-huh. cooker watchers on Twitter looked into this and saw nothing of it, not on Telegram, not on Facebook, ah, just Yemeni. Yeah, a protest organiser on Telegram said this responding to a, a rebel news headline that claimed the planned protest had thwarted the rainbow lights. My question is, who planned this freedom protest, planned for the shrine? None of us know about the protest that was meant to be on Sunday. So it's been gone. And no planning. There was no plan. There wasn't a plan. But there's two good reasons for this to have been created. First and foremost is that Yemeni has been a bit light on protest content recently and need an excuse to go out, hit the pavement, grab a microphone, get his giant idiot bodyguard out and make a prick for himself in public. It's just what he does. And then, of course, he edits it down to make himself the hero of his own story. Who's a Nazi, by the way? Wasn't he, Joel? He's a, he's a Nazi, isn't he, uh, Yemeni's bodyguard? What, the giant bodyguard? Yeah, didn't we actually fight against Nazis at one particular point? <laughs> I think that's my understanding of history. Yeah, the amount of Nazis that have been hanging out at the shrine is just fucking terrifying on that protest. But anyway, so this is the other thing, though. Like, saying the lights were cancelled due to threats to staff doesn't have the same freedom ring to it, you know? Mm, it's that thing yeah. of, like, are we the bad guys? Like, yes, yeah. you are. You are. You send death threats to people in the RSL because you get pissy about rainbows. You fucking creeps. Yeah, while well, cookers have openly denied the claim that threats were behind the cancellation with real ruction. Oh, oh, there's a reliable source. Claiming <laughs> that the CEO was lying. A classic ruction move to whitewash the terrible actions of his allies. Avi Yemeni managed to find a guard at the shrine who said that there weren't threats, but simply hate mail and went on to accuse the CEO of lying. The usual Avi Yemeni trash. Yeah, textbook stuff from him. And a Nazi on Telegram said this, and I'm not going to name him because he's no, a piece of shit. No, don't name Nazis. And there's also a massive context. homophobic word coming up here, just as a general thing. Um, mm. I'm going to say this because I don't want to make you say it. Bullying works. This is the quote. Bullying works. The fags decided to cancel lighting up the shrine as a result of threats and abuse. Little sunglasses face emoji. Oh, nice. Now we bully the head of the shrine into resignation. Keep the ball rolling, don't let up. I mean, the threats were real. Yeah, again, just got that vague memory. Yeah. Australia fighting Nazis. North yeah. Africa, I think, was the uh, the campaign there, uh, fighting the Desert Corps, the uh, the Nazi Desert Corps. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm not sure why Nazis have got much to fucking say about, about they, Australia's war dead. They have a lot to say because, like we said, they just project their bullshit onto the war dead and try and steal their valour because they're mm. soulless pieces of shit. Exactly. So, look. Once again, the cookers are behaving badly to get their way, and then they use this classic revisionist history trick to absolve themselves of any wrongdoing. Or they just blame anti-fascists, you know, as they want to do. They love love doing that. Oh, someone else sent the threats. All the threats don't exist. I mean... Yeah, the Rebel News headline that claimed a protest was planned didn't follow the usual rules to build a cooker rally. Telegram and Facebook groups that pushed these plans to the masses were not activated. He just said, there's a protest plan, and hoped it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. He was taking a cue from Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. Harvey, if you tweet it, 
They will go. And a few did, but not many. From my estimates, and I asked Soz to back this up, it was about 15. And I would love to say this was so cookers noticed. aren't low enough to go on protest fallen soldiers being commemorated, but it was just badly organized. They're definitely low enough to do that. They yelled at an op shop. So <laughs> it just wasn't organized at all. That's the real thing here. Avi yeah. Yemeni just claimed that it was a thing and went from there because that's what he kind of does. The cooker movement are clearly becoming more and more like the Westboro Baptist Church as time goes on. It sort of and reminds me of, yeah. Not a popular group, I'm just going to mm. say. I'm, I'd love to see Louis Theroux going to the Freedom Movement in Australia. That would be fucking fantastic. So <laughs> at the protest, constitutional scholar and leopard print enthusiast Jackie Dundee was there filming herself just being annoying. At first, quietly, and as the rum and cokes kicked in, she started making more and more noise. Alleged girl basher and veteran LARPer Glenn Agnew was there being awful and making sure everyone knew what a victim he was after being charged with assault on Mandy Metal in Canberra for, you know... Various offences. Mm. It's unfair, though. I mean, what? What's this consequences? Consequences. Shit? Consequences. What? I, I what? don't want no stinking consequences. <laughs> Yeah, all of this lines up with what is an extraordinarily awful time for the LGBTIQ community, especially in Victoria. With the state election on the horizon and the Victorian Liberals doubling down on trans and homophobic candidates who are mouthpieces of hatred legitimised by political candidacy, we are seeing an uptick in gay and trans panic we haven't seen since the marriage equality plebiscite in 2017. And it's not just in Victoria. The attempt to create a pride round by the Manly Sea Eagles recently, putting a rainbow stripe on their jersey for a Thursday night game, caused an absolute fucking erupt with seven dopey Mormons on the team refusing to wear the jersey. Absolute storm in a teacup, but the jersey sponsor was points bet. Apparently gambling is fine, but gays are the real problem. I mean, I'm not entirely sure that's what Jesus was intending, guys. Just just saying. (laughs) Yeah, look, uh, it was terrible. I mean, the club just didn't do it well. They didn't communicate very well. They should have perhaps got someone like Ian Roberts to come and speak to the guys. I mean, it was just just essentially a mention, a a, a message of of tolerance. And, And it was just completely lost. I mean, you know, Hollywood celebrities or Australian Hollywood celebrities got their Manly Seagulls jersey before the players did. Come on. Yeah. You can do better than that. Yeah, I see. You can do better man. than that. I still, Manly. I got a soft spot for them because I think it's brave to be the first one and sometimes the first one makes the mistakes. The Roosters have been doing it for years. Have they? Without a blue. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yep. for years. Those Sydney gays. Those Sydney, Sydney gays. The Northern Beach is apparently <laughs> den of intolerance. Don't knock the demographic. You know, you need to build your numbers in, 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 in the people who are watching football. Yeah, yeah, That's what totally it's all fair. about, really, in the end. It's about getting more bums on seats and, and uh, on couches watching the watching the, uh, the Fill up those league. Paddington pubs. Mm. So, look, the culture wars are kicking off. I really do hope they die down after election November because I think a lot of stakeholders are going to pull their heads out. But it looks like a lot of cookers are, as we predicted a long time ago, moving on from vaccines and lockdowns and straight to right-wing outrage tropes. It was mm-hmm. kind of always going to happen. The new trope is that gay and trans people are groomers that manipulate children into sex. This makes me so fucking angry. Yeah, There's no angry. basis for this at all. If there was, None. I would join None. their ranks. But all this serves is to simply demonize a community. It's purely political and is driven by hatred. Stupid, pointless hatred. Cookers at the shrine call the RSL a bunch of pedophile protectors. But on what basis? See, all this is, is they've convinced themselves that if you're gay or trans, you're a pedophile. It's that simple in these fucking single-digit IQ brains. And while we would be best served to ignore these voices in our community, they happen to walk around cities with megaphones, shouting it in highly dense areas. Screaming it's, at buildings. They Pe- scream everywhere. Pedophile buildings. To be fair, pedophiles are in buildings. So, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, well, yeah, there is a correlation there. Yeah. But, I mean, until they're arrested for doing this or just, you know, sort of shot from a clock tower, people in minority groups are just going to continually feel attack, mm-hmm. under there attack, will be. There by will be attack. unhinged right-wing extremists. And it's just an unsafe environment. This rhetoric amplifies it's taken straight from the playbook in the USA where organisations like oh. Disney that voiced opposition to the don't say gay laws in Florida were instantly painted as attempting to normalise sex with minors. It's despicable behaviour from the right who will do anything in their power to hurt people they don't like. Mm-hmm. It's divorce from reality which is meaningless in a post-truth era where outrage porn shapes ideology and truth is too boring and stale for the loudest, lowest denominator. The message must be clear. Intolerance will not be tolerated. These dying gasps of an irrelevant movement must be met with severe condemnation. Anything less validates this movement, fueled by hate, othering, and fear. 
Fuck them. Fuck them. And speaking of fuckers, in other news, astonishingly unelected Great Australia Party Senate candidate and former One Nation Senator Rod Cullerton, he's in exile, has had a bit of a barney with a magistrate in trying to have his bail conditions altered because they were inconvenient to the great man. Yes, a bit inconvenient. According to the Kalgoorlie miner, and we thank patron Gerg for this, champion work Gerg. Love ya. The man who continues to describe himself as a senator in exile, continues to call himself that, by the way, appeared by video link from Esperance Courthouse, Carlton lives in Perth apparently, to appear before Magistrate Andrew Matthews to have his bail conditions changed because Carlton believed fronting up to the Esperance Police Station or indeed any other police station in WA was a bit of a stretch. Fair. Carlton has been charged with assaulting a public officer and the matter will be heard in a Perth courtroom at a date to be fixed in October. And when he first appeared in court, Carlton was given the option of providing a surety, that is a, an amount of money or reporting to police regularly and chose the latter. So he actually chose. Oh, oh, no, 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 I won't give you any money uh, to put up as a bond or a surety. Oh, uh... I'm happy with the police reporting. Was it a choice, though? Does he have money? Did he have an option? Yeah, you wouldn't be be taking any checks from him. Pay your creditors, Carlton. Pay your creditors. (laughs) The great man... Uh, is not happy with that either now. So you're not happy not happy with the reporting functions. Carlton has indicated Aww. he will have the matter heard in the High Court, regardless of the outcome, because he believes the Wayne Glue bullshit that WA lower courts have no jurisdiction. Charles, your deeds and titles. Due to an arcane interpretation of a textbook of Portuguese maritime law. Yeah. 17th right. century, I believe. Yeah. Anyway. It all blew up into a wonderful piece of sobsit shit fuckery, which should have been this week's sobsit for the man. I, I did e-mark this and thought, oh, that was good. But the segment has been filled with a new contender who has made an absolute art form of being a delusional prat in court. It's really good. Really. It's a, bu- it's, it's it's, a busy sobsit time. It's so Carl- good. Yeah. Carlton argued with the uh, uh, stop entering magistrate claiming it was an alleged assault, uh-huh. as it was an alleged assault, he should be able to modify the conditions of his bail as he saw fit. You as know, he what he got there yeah, for yeah. the conditions. I'll just run a line through that. Yes, not how it worked, great man. It no. just isn't. No. Yeah, the match grew tired of Carlton's idiocy and threatened to turn off the audio, silencing Carlton, only to be told, I have a right to be heard and you have a right to listen. <laughs> not a responsibility, a right. I've got to sit it's here. Just, it's my right to sit here and listen to it you. It doesn't make any sense. Shit. Again, not how it works, right? No. Then. It's really not. And this is the thing. Like, Magistrate Matthews told Carlton his request of his bail conditions altered was denied because oh. he had no confidence he would appear in court as summons. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Fair. Fair call. Fair I mean, call. Like, I'm not... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to doubt that. So here we are. The Great Australia Party man has been ordered to continue reporting to Esperance Police Station. And let's see, uh, Rod Zero, the man, how many? Like 30 or so? <laughs> I mean... Double figures, definitely. Yeah, it's not good. It's not good. Just stop trying, Rod. Just give up. And in our final news item, we are summoning Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> Namely, the Trump crypt. You are just a 90s reference generator. It's great. It's great. (laughs) More than 15 years ago, Trump began planning a family cemetery on the Trump National Golf Club in Bedminster, New Jersey, home to his favourite golf course. The size and design of the project has changed over the years, but this month his ex-wife, Ivana, became the first person known to be buried on the property. Known. I like how you say that. Like what? Like he's got like mobster <laughs> hits buried couple, under the greens? A couple of human shapes. A couple of pesky Probably contractors. Up on the turf there. Oh, look. How are you going to have to putt around that? Donald, I'd like you to pay my bills. I set up your plumbing. Oh, yeah, this don't is, worry. I'll, I'll pay him. This is the bit I love. This is his original plans for the mausoleum where he would eventually be interred himself, included a 19-foot-high classical-style stone structure to be built at the golf club, which features two courses. It's a 36-hole golf club. Oh, and nice. this was according to local news site NJ.com, who reported this in 2012. The mausoleum would have included four imposing obelisks <laughs> surrounding its exterior and a small altar and six vaults inside, nice. according to NJ.com. But after encountering opposition from city officials who called the design overwhelming, I'm quoting, overwhelming and garish, unquote, (laughs) Trump floated the idea of redesigning the structure as a mausoleum come chapel. Ah. And this was according to the Washington Post. Plans for the large-scale mausoleum were ultimately scrapped and Trump proposed several other cemetery redesigns, including a 284-plot portion of the golf course with burial sites available for purchase on the golf course. No such cemetery has yet been built, but according to news website, 
cite the insider, or just insider, the presence of burial grounds on the golf course property could offer tax breaks to the business. And uh, let's face it, Jack, the Donald has never met a tax break he didn't like. Oh, no. Come then, on. Wait, wait, wait. Tax break? Oh, oh. Let's just start putting the dead in there now. I mean, I could just not pay my taxes, but aside from that, I like it when they like invite me. It's good. So Ivana Trump, the Donald's first wife, who he traded in for a later model of Melania, was laid to rest on the property earlier this month in a modest grave in a grassy area behind the first hole of one of the courses. Not too far from the main clubhouse, the New York Andy. Post reported, which is a good position, I suppose. Yeah, right, good spot. Right next good to all spot. the contractors that he killed instead of paying their bills. And, I mean, sadly, she did recently die following a fall in her Upper well, East Side home on yeah, July 14th. That's now, why I'm, she was buried, Joel. You can't bury look, them if they're still alive. But I'm not exactly going to smile about the fact the poor old lady died. But I no. mean, you know. No, look, in any of it, I have questions, Joel. So many questions. Did the original design of six crypts, let's do the maths. One for the Donald, yeah. one for Ivanka, one for yeah. Ivana, one yeah. for Melania, yeah. one for Junior, and yeah. one for Baron. Yeah. So that's six. Yeah. What about Eric? Oh. Was it the Trumpster's intention to shuffle the good-looking boy off in a press board coffin and leave him out in the street with a hard rubbish collection? Just throw him in the trash. Now, once thwarted by planning permissions, did the Donald design his 284-plot golf course come cemetery in order to be buried as far away as geographically possible <laughs> from the good-looking boy. Good theory. <laughs> All I can say is Eric's been doing a lot of crying recently and that's possibly why. Oh, there's like a hundred reasons why Eric's going to be crying. The Trump National Golf Club in Bedminster is currently hosting the LIV Golf Tournament, you know, the Saudi one, which has recently faced controversy for being funded by Saudi Crown Prince MBS. A little bit of murdering on the side. Uh, mm. The USPGA has consistently snubbed Trump's begging to host one of its official tournaments at Bedminster, but has made it abundantly clear during his presidency that he has no issue taking a bit of bread from the Saudis. Money. I'll do anything for you. Money. Just tell me what you want me to do. Today's condition release program is proudly brought to you by John. Roll out the fucking barrels and get me the <laughs> fuck out of this place, Barillaro. Our listeners, what better man to represent New South Wales' interests than a retired politician who managed to be re-elected by standing on a corner in downtown Queanbeyan, passing out New South Wales Treasury pineapples to passers-by, provided they promised to vote for him. When Barrel said he wanted out of this fucking place, he didn't mean New South Wales or even the New South Wales Parliament. He meant the existential vortex he found himself in when he had to knock back a half million a year in the best fucking drinks trolley there is that he'd earned the hard way by treating taxpayers' money, not as his own, but put in a trust in his wife's name just to keep prying fucking journalists away from it. Smart. Listeners, New South Wales has a long history of technical corruption and has always been overshadowed by the governor of misuse of public office, that bloody Queenslander, Joe Biocchi person. But in barrels, we have a contender, the sort of man that makes Russ Hins look like Bobby fucking Kennedy before he got shot in the head. A bit of state pride restored right there. Mm -hmm. What better man to be New South Wales representative in New York? Who better to handle the queries from Americans keen to turn a dollar in the promised land? You know, like, no, it's not in Wales. That's in England. Yeah, nah, Austria's in Western Europe, mate. And yeah, we speak English, but we're no fucking good at spelling and stuff. <laughs> Americans won't be able to restrain themselves from investing in the great state of New South Wales. Just make that check out the cash before Barrels get sick of the big fucking apple as well. <laughs> Remember, listeners, Barrels has got New South Wales interests at heart by the barrel load. <laughs> One of the first things it says within the Constitution is all laws within all, within. And with the sage words of former bouncer and current constitutional expert Thanos Paniedis ringing in our shell likes, it means it's time for which Black Bill fuckwit said that. The quiz show we plan to have presented by Andrew Beefy O'Keefe but we couldn't afford the weekly meth bill. Oh, controversial. And if you're successful in today's Witch Black Pill, fuck with said that, job. You'll be given a plum job paying almost Ooh. half a million dollars a year, plus all the swill you can yes. eat before having the job rudely taken from you, your oh. reputation such as it is, trashed, what and reputation? the job given to a politician whose sole aim is to be the worst appointed representative of this country since Vince Gare. 
was sexually harassing secretaries two at a time and being pissed every single fucking day before lunchtime as Australia's ambassador to Ireland and the Holy See way back in the 1970s. That is Long a story. niche reference. That's that strong, is very strong. niche. That was Goff, <laughs> Vince Gere was the leader of the DLP in the Senate and Gough Whitlam gave him the plum job, the ambassador to Ireland and the Holy See. Gare took the job. Uh, and uh, and Labor picked up the number in the Senate, allowing oh. them to move forward. And it was a horrible, horrible choice because he really was just a drunken lech <laughs> who misbehaved on a daily basis until finally, I think it was about 1976, Fraser removed him. It was Good just Lord. awful. If it had have happened today, he'd be on criminal charges in <laughs> Ireland and in the Vatican. Good. Good. Anyway, we want to thank listener Cap and Happy for this one. Bless. And it's very complicated. But we'll start with a quote. When people who lie for a living are telling you that you're a liar, when people whose job it is to spread disinformation are accusing you of doing that, you kind of want to dig in a little bit and not give an inch to people who you know aren't criticising you in good faith. Okay. Was that truth teller, once a very fine journalist who has a bit of a sniffle. Wait, it's the man flu, and he's pretty sure he got it from one of those darn Ukrainian bio labs, Glenn Greenwald. Dickhead. Or was it Truth Teller, who just filed the company behind Infowars for bankruptcy yeah. in a desperate bid to avoid an estimated $150 million damages bill? Alex Jones. Couldn't happen to a better bloke. Or was it Truth Teller, former Democrat congresswoman who has had the lurgy for a week? It's not pouring out of too many orifices to name here, and she's pretty sure she got it from the darned Ukrainian bio labs. Tulsi Gabbard. They take away your humanity. Or was it truth teller, Russian president for life and then death at the hands of those darned Ukrainian biolabs of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin? I mean, look, there's every chance it was all of the above, but I'm going with Glenn Greenwald. <laughs> well done, yes, Joe, excellent yeah. work. Yeah. I haven't heard the quote, but it's just one of those things where, like, Glenn used to be an interesting guy. Yeah, he used to be a good journalist. Really good journalist. He used to do his thing. And then he got this weird thing. Maybe he, like, acquired mm. a brain injury or something. Well, because... guess, who he's in- guess who he was interviewing at the time, Joel? Oh, uh, fuck. Like, what, Tucker Carlson or something? Alex Jones at uh. the time. So what he's talking about there is... Uh, is talking about the the uh, the claims on the the mass spree shooting event. Oh, that's right. I have heard about this. Yeah. So yeah. it's an awful, awful uh, quote when taken in its full context. I didn't want to read all of that out, but thanks to Cap and Happy for doing that. Yes. Yeah, it's a good one. Greenwald was not interested in talking about the spree shooting that Jones said never happened and was basically a false flag attack. Uh, a spree shooting in a in a in a primary school, by the way. Yes. Uh, he didn't he was not interested in that from a journalistic point of view. He really no. wanted to talk to him about lies and how people can lie and then then he'd have to lie in response. It was just yes. awful, oh, it's awful terrible. piece of work. Terrible, then, terrible individual. A journalist who has clearly lost his way. But the intercept have managed to carry on without him without being too tarnished. Well done. Yeah. Okay. Quite too. Well, you're on your way to getting that job before Fuck. having it rudely yes. Taken from you. No. Um, okay. Here's the quote. The concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non competitive. Nah, that's an angle. Was that lover of Disney caricatures, hatred of Uyghurs, president for life with a non parole period of 12 years, Xi Jinping? <laughs> Or was that beloved Disney caricature, where's my fucking honey, you bastard, Chinese president for life lookalike, Winnie the Pooh? Or was it NASA's resident PR spokesman at the Kennedy Center, space is really, really big and scary dark, Uh George Diller? Or was it undead and awaiting planning approval for a gigantic crypt visible from the lunar surface, the 45th POTUS, that's Mr. President to you, Donald Trump? It's probably Winnie the Pooh, but I'm going to go with Donald Trump. Rachel! Oh, excellent work. Yes, it was. It was a quote that he quite famously made as president. <laughs> Fuck it. The concept hell. of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non competitive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right, Donald. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
Just eat some KFC and All shut the right. fuck up. You're about to get the plum job before before having whipped away from you. Honestly, three months of that salary and I'm I'm ahead. You know, right. I'm good. I reckon you'll get this one too. My money's on this. All right. Here's the quote. You can now have an abortion in NZ, that's New Zealand, for any, in caps, reason, Finally. without doctor consultation good. until birth. The baby can be partially born yes. for harvesting their hearts and then, in, in quotation marks, aborted. Oh, so they abort them after harvesting the heart. Mm, yeah. yeah. That's spicy. The baby will have no pain relief whatsoever. Oh. Not even an aspirin. Well, I mean, why waste it? Why waste the pain relief on them? I mean, Who said that? Was it speaking from hell? How the fuck did that happen? Pope John Paul II. Yeah. Uh, was it? Embryos have feelings. Feelings of disgust towards me. Donate now. The irrelevance is really starting to kick in. Monica yeah. Smith. Yeah, she's gone real good. Was it Australia's best argument for retrospective abortion? Phanos Paniades. Yeah. Coat hanger. Or was it New Zealand's best argument for retrospective abortion? But who's her daddy? Karen Brewer. And where did she go to school? That's yeah. got to be Monica Smith. Yes. Yeah. Forget bodily autonomy and vaccines because she's sticking her nose in women's uteri. Oh, this is where she's always wanted to be. This is her home. Yeah, it's exactly right. And it's just a whole new gig now, you know. She's going to present to presidents and tell them how appalling it is for women to have their own reproductive rights. And the terrifying thing is she's probably actually going to get somewhere with it, but let's see what happens. I want to see if she drags people like Paniedes in too, you know, because he's stupid enough to get involved in that. He really fucking is. He really is. So there you go, Joel. (laughs) I'm off. New South Wales trade ambassador to your. City. Did he even get uh, to but, New York? Uh, wait I a minute. Uh, uh, Barrels has just Barrels has just put his hand up, and I'm afraid you'll have to come home. Oh no, you're not even going to leave, uh, but you'll have your reputation trashed in public uh, in a in a parliamentary inquiry. I will find my revenge somehow, and it will be cold and sweet. Oh dear, uh, the trade minister in a spot of bother. Can't see how he'll survive it. And of course, Barrels Barrels has uh, Barrels has resigned anyway, retired anyway, so he's gone. Um, he'll it's be fine. just a nightmare. And it'll roll He's got all the way money. into the next election, which is as far away as March of next year. Oh, can and we it just it? makes them look shitty and terrible and corrupt. Even though, you know, they might not be systemically corrupt, it certainly looks like they were looking after one another. And it's a it's a good I mean, I think they are wide open to get rolled next year. I hope so. I hope so. It's time. It's time. We fired you, we sacked you, we dismissed you as what? As garbage, because that's all you are. You're a criminal, you're a traitor, and you're going to the biggest barbecue in history. So from Christmas dinner to you are the dinner. Thank you, that's what I'll go with. And we want to thank excellent friends of the program, Celery Sorbet, and give Celery a follow on Twitter if you haven't already, because they do fine work. Oh, very fine work. Also, Big thanks to Andrew for giving us a heads up on this because it Thank is you, great. Actually, a few people sent us this, but I mean, like, we have to have a credit sequence if we we're going to send them all. It's a lot, yeah. So this week, Sobs It's Be The Man concerns the fleshly Cameron Robert Mackay, 34 <laughs> years young, man described in the ACT Magistrates Court last week as an idiot. An idiot. An idiot. That's a direct quote from the magistrate. That yep. is. And it would seem he is not just an idiot, but an idiot in the flesh who, he claims, lives everywhere his fleshly body goes. It is so <laughs> hard to say with a straight face. <laughs> Fuck. Yes, Magistrate Margaret Hunter described Mackay as an idiot after an affidavit <laughs> was filed by him. He's a soft sit and was described by the magistrate, the affidavit that is, as gobbledygook. Yeah, sounds very right. Mackay appeared to have confirmed the rough character assessment as he engaged in a shouting match with the magistrate before his audio was turned off. Mm-hmm. Cameron Robert Mackay, 34, we said his age, but we may as well say it again, He's is young. accused of assaulting a then 67-year-old woman mm. in February well, when all the cookers were in, in, the, in Canberra yep. uh, in an incident in February that left her needing surgery to 
both her wrists, ACT mm. policing said on Friday. The woman was working at a venue inside Epic, you know, when yeah. she has to deal with, uh, we'd have to deal with these idiots. It was a race course, I think. Mackay of Kings Langley in New South Wales in the, what would you call that, sort of northwest uh, of Sydney, allegedly fractured both the woman's wrists while causing a disturbance. Yep. He did a runner in February, leaving ACT police to issue a video asking the public to help identify him. And he was subsequently arrested in May in Sydney by the New South Wales Wallopers Good. and granted bail to attend the ACT Magistrates Court. Mm-hmm. He was later granted uh, a bail in court on the condition he returned to the ACT for future appearances, but he allegedly failed to do so. I have to say allegedly because he's been charged with bail offences. Yeah. He allegedly failed to do so in June and July and warrants were issued for his arrest. And on Wednesday, 24 July, with a bench warrant in place, he was arrested by New South Wales Police and ACT Police subsequently had him extradited where he cooled his fleshly heels for the next 48 hours or so. Oh, and they are so fleshly. Can you imagine just the cost of this prosecution so far? Yeah, it's with outrageous. extradition proceedings, you know. And anyway. just because some clown wanted to speak over a loudspeaker. Mm. So... Mackay appeared in the ACT Magistrates Court on Friday 26th of July when he pleaded not guilty to recklessly inflict grievous bodily harm, trespass on premises, failing to comply with a magistrate's order, and failing to appear in court as part of his bail requirements. Yeah, that there's, is your, a there's list. your bail breaches there, allegedly. And as any good sobsit would do, he represented himself in court, and as any sobsit would do, did so very badly. Yeah, very badly. I mean, typical. He represented himself and applied for bail. He constantly argued with Special Magistrate Margaret Hunter about his name, a classic, which is, and I quote, you can call me Cameron Robert of the House McKay. (laughs) And then he went on to say, I'm not a person. I'm I'm under duress right now. The name that you have there is not I. It's not under the Chicago Style Manual. (laughs) Fuck's sake. (laughs) The Chicago Style Manual. How the Chicago Style Manual gets a mention is really... It's great. uh, For those wondering, the Chicago Style Manual is a style guide for American English, you know, for newspapers, book publication, etc. And it's been published since 1906 by the University of Chicago Press. Rob Sooty would know why he said it. It doesn't have a lot of relevancy. It's weird. It's a weird thing. Rob would know, but I have no idea. I tried to look. I don't know. I should have looked on Freeman Delusion. Yeah, it's not under the Chicago Style Manual. My name is not there. As the argument prolonged, Miss Hunter told him, No, you're an idiot, Mr. Mackay. Yeah. That's what you are. You are wasting the court's time, she said. Good. And after the party settled on his name being Cameron Robert, as opposed (laughs) to Cameron Mackay, as listed in the court documents, he continued to talk over the magistrate. Good idea. Always yeah. a good idea. Oh, they talk love over it. the magistrate. When the magistrate's trying to talk, just talk straight over the top of They, them. Love, they love it. They, they you, love it. They just fall in love with you and say, you can go and, look, you can take that police officer's gun with you. They just say, you're such an alpha male. I just I just <laughs> bow to you. Okay, um, I'm getting a little bit moist sitting here. Fuck yeah. Fucking hell, idiot. Uh, but her final words were, shut up. Not final words, but it's final, probably her final direction uh, in that particular exchange was, shut up until I'm finished. Good. The defendant, uh, the <laughs> Who is not? In the, who is not in the Chicago Style Manual? No. Uh, argued he did not fail to appear because I made a special appearance by way of registered mail, but uh, said he did not receive a response. He didn't even get a thank you. Oh, you know? <laughs> See, that nerve. was a gobbledygook affidavit, which you just looked at and gone, you know where this belongs? In, in the fucking bin. Yeah. Yeah. Burn it, bin it. So he said, "No, oh, I appeared. Oh, well, I didn't appear in person, but I did send a, I did send a letter, which was just a bizarre rant. Yes, a series of fingerprints and <laughs> so weird surely, gibberish. Surely that's enough. I wish we had the letter. Oh, I was looking. I was trying to find it. I really wanted to find that gobbledygook affidavit. But he oh. got, went on and say, all of this stuff you're doing to me." A living, breathing man who was appearing via a monitor to speak to you. He said. Like, like, like he's doing everyone a favour. You know, oh, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. I'm under. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm under duress. I'm under duress here. I, 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 you've forced me into a contract with you by this yeah. video link. It's terrible. The magistrate hunter asked her associate to to mute him at times after <laughs> warning him to respect the process and be quiet when others were speaking. Shush, shush. Turn him off. I've told him. She said. 
I'm a big fan of this magistrate. And when She's the great. hearing finally got to the bail application, Magistrate Hunter asked him why it should be granted. And he said, I will attend in the flesh. <laughs> Yeah. And Magistrate Hunter then said Pinky she was promise? minded to grant him bail, but only if he promised to attend in the flesh. <laughs> Pinky, I mean, Pinky promise. She she kind of caves to him there, but I kind of like it because I think she's probably laughing under her breath. Yeah, it's either on that or just locking this guy up for a, for a month or two, just yeah. getting him fucking dealt with. The defendant also asked Miss Hunter to change his name in court documents to Cameron Robert of the Mackay House, which <laughs> the special magistrate noted, and I'm not she sure what that even means. So no, what she just noted. Said, I'm noting that. Yeah. I'm noting that. Now, shut up. Yeah. He said he still lived near Kings Langley, and this is great because, quote, I don't live in the postal box that's connected to the house. Mm. I live everywhere my fleshly body goes. <laughs> the fuck does that mean? I mean, come this, on, man. This is my favourite part. Let's have some dignity. You know, after spending a night in the cells, might have been two, but definitely one, and with bail granted, the fleshly Mackay emerged from the ACT courthouse assuming some sort of rock star personage, you know. No comment, no comment. He said to absolutely no <laughs> one. No there case. wasn't anyone there sort of, you know, and hanging a microphone. He just walked straight out of the courthouse and says, no comment, no comment. <laughs> and then proceeded to comment to anyone who was within earshot it, by screaming at journalists who were, you know, outside the building a bit a bit of a distance away. No Wait, comment, no I'm comment. Going. Oh, yeah. hey, you fucking bastards. I am not yeah. a crook. His bar conditions include reporting to Blacktown Police Station. He is scheduled to reattend court in the flesh on yep. October 7th. I think it's on, yeah, I'm not sure the date has been set, but it's definitely in, 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 in October and we'll be watching. Fuck yes. So let's take a look at the scoreboard, Joel. Two breaches of bail, allegedly. Bail granted on <laughs> third occasion. Idiocy confirmed. By the court. Yep. And with the big one coming up later in the year, I'm going to say the scoreline reads, some sits zero, the man won. Yep. And this guy, <laughs> the man from Mackay House, uh, doesn't appear to be living in a van down by the river. Nor the letterbox. Nor has he been on a strict diet of government cheese. No, no. he doesn't live in the letterbox either. Doesn't. He lives wherever he goes, which with a little luck we'll see his fleshly body in H.M. Alexander McConaughey Centre. Fingers crossed because let's not forget there's a 67-year-old woman, or she yeah. was at the time, she might be 68 by now, yeah. who had her wrists broken, yeah. fractures that required surgery and would have left her horribly incapacitated. Can you imagine it? Yeah. For a long She's- period of time by that fleshly prick, allegedly. Yeah, she was just trying to go to work, but the old fleshly Mackay doesn't give one single solitary shit about that and absolutely never fucking will. What a scumbag. Fuck him. I, I still haven't worked it out yet. And if you haven't worked it out, keep asking the question. And keep looking for the answers. Because it's irrelevant. The story of Hunter Biden's laptop is an absolute shambles where everyone is an asshole. Everyone. Everyone. What began with an inebriated Hunter Biden dropping off a laptop to John Paul Mac Isaac, the legally blind owner of a Delaware computer store, turned into a complete shit fight of finger pointing, disinformation, big tech overreach, and a shitload of dick pics. Mm. And I need to make it clear that I have absolutely no love for Hunter Biden here, and I will make that clear over the course of the episode. He's a piece of shit. He yeah. really is. Not only did he have an affair while married to his wife, Kathleen, but he did it with his brother's widow, Hallie. Ooh. That is some dark shit right there. Hunter Biden's perpetual misbehavior may have a very sad root cause, which is the car crash that killed his mother and infant sister, Naomi. Mm-hmm. Both Hunter and Bo were critically injured in the crash and both survived, with Bo suffering multiple broken bones, but Hunter sustained a fractured skull and severe traumatic brain injuries. Now, I don't want to make excuses, but brain injuries can have a dramatic impact on one's behavior. Well, they certainly can. Yeah. And <laughs> like I say, no excuses, but it can place some context on some of the more bizarre behavior Hunter exhibits. The coverage in the media of the laptop contents is incredibly partisan. You know, the lines are drawn. First, it was Russian disinformation. Yeah. Once that was debunked after the presidential election, of course, it became a matter of whether Hunter Biden is an innocent victim of drugs and trauma or... He's a criminal mastermind using his father's power to make a fortune, which he then spends on crack and hookers. And one thing we can say for sure is that he spends a lot of money on crack and hookers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So much. 
Hunter Biden has all the red flags of a huge narcissist, and I can't really blame him. Guy's good looking, powerful family, huge cock. I mean, yeah. who wouldn't have tickets on themselves? Yeah, you've got to stop thinking about his penis. He's got a Go great on. cock, though. We'll talk about it later. Yeah, okay. But it I've doesn't really cock explain cock, cock chat. why he felt so compelled to take pictures of himself doing drugs. Sex videos, I can kind of understand. Yeah. But what's with the fetish for taking pictures and video of yourself being a cook junkie? You know, the mind continues to boggle on that one. You know, footballers, Hunter Biden. I mean, they're all doing it. Stop taking photos of yourself doing drugs. That's that's the takeaway. The contents of the laptop are were spicy. I mean, Miranda Devine dubbed it the laptop from hell, implying that sex and drugs are somehow from hell. But you know, <laughs> it was it was certainly interesting. If they're from hell, I want to go. <laughs> yeah. Now, with this story, it's best to start from the top and work your way down. And it starts on Friday night in April 2019 at the Mac Shop in Wilmington, Delaware. Hunter turned up around 6.50pm, which is around 10 minutes before closing, with three MacBook Pros allegedly stinking of booze, according to Mac Isaac. So when checking in the computers, Mac Isaac saw a Bo Biden Foundation sticker, and when asked for his name, the man responded, Hunter. But then when asked for his surname, he sort of paused and sort of like, as if like, you know, you don't know, and then <laughs> replied with, Biden. Don't you know who I am? Don't you yeah. know who I am, bro? That's why I fucking hate this guy. The more I hear about him, the more I just detest him. This just, like to me, cements the fact the guy's an asshole. It's this arrogance, this entitlement, this shitty personality, and it runs all through the story. And I just want to say, I have zero sympathy for this guy. Absolutely fucking none. He's been dragged through the mud and honestly couldn't happen to a nicer bloke. The MacBooks were water damaged, wouldn't turn on, but this is the thing. One of the machines came to life, but the keyboard was fucked. So Mac Isaac plugged in an external keyboard and asked Hunter for his password. It was anal fuck 69. Mm. Just come on, man. Grow the fuck up. Apparently, yeah. he was also stunned by the fact that you could plug an external keyboard into a laptop, which is a whole nother story. Mac what Isaac goes into a God. lot of detail about the interaction he had with Hunter and the whole computer repair process. We're not going to go into too much of it. But this is basically what happened. When Mac Isaac was recovering the files, thumbnails of Hunter Biden doing insane and gross shit flashed across the screen. And while Mac Isaac has seen his fair share of porn on computers and he speaks openly about this, this was all a bit more personal. But that's just a part of the job. You know, you see stuff people have on computers, but you're paid yeah. to ignore this shit. You know, there's a level of trust between a client and a computer guy. And while you might see something, you certainly don't fucking say something. You leave it alone, you pretend you didn't see it, and you call it a day. Unless you're sort of getting into the Gary Glitter territory. You know? Oh, if it's illegal in that regard, then you absolutely, absolutely go for it. And the illegality of things, you but know. this wasn't. You know, this was sex and drugs with hookers. You know? Yeah, exactly. And it's not illegal. It's not. Unfortunately, Mac Isaac is not a man of great integrity. He saw a PDF called Income and decided to have a look at it. And that is an objectively shitty thing to do. Yeah. I don't care whose laptop it is and what you're doing, you're not meant to look through people's personal files. Exactly. Right. Turns out Hunter was making over a million dollars a year, which is, once again, none of your fucking business. But Mac Isaac decided the document seemed shady. Yeah, at this point, it's important to mention that Mac Isaac is a Trump supporter. Uh, this makes his actions, or was, and I'm not sure he may not be these days, but he certainly was he at is. the time. This makes his actions from here make a little bit more sense. Hunter never came back for the laptop. Mac Isaac claims he smelled of booze when he dropped it off and remained in his car for some time before leaving. Was he looking at his phone, smoking a cheeky crack pipe before going to his next destination? Either way, it sounds like he's just simply forgot, just so brain fucked. Yeah. Yeah. And he just completely forgot that he'd taken the computers there. He wasn't well. Dropping a computer off and then never coming back to pay the bill is a dick move, but Mac Isaac had a clause in his contract that stipulated after 90 days the laptop became his property and 90 days passed. The laptop and its contents were, somewhat questionably, legally his. And then Mac Isaac eventually went on to give the laptop to the FBI. His story about giving the laptop to the FBI is laced with these paranoid implications, all this dramatic flair. And this makes sense, considering the fact that he went on to publish a book on his experience called American Injustice, mm. which is such a loaded title. I mean... Come on, clearly there's an angle here. Yes. While I would argue that Mac Isaac giving the drive to Giuliani was a seriously questionable move, which he justifies by saying he was motivated by the idea that there may be evidence of criminal behavior on the drive, giving it to the cops was one thing, but giving it to a political operative was just an absolute dog move. And this is 
this to preface this, Mac Isaac gave the laptop to the FBI, took a copy of the drive, and then gave a copy of the drive to Rudy Giuliani, who's not a trustworthy figure or a good person. But no. that being said, Mac Isaac has paid dearly for his role in this. When he finally handed the laptop to the FBI, he was happy to be rid of it, and he speaks openly of that in his story, which he recounted a million times. But the fact that he gave it to the human sideshow Giuliani, I mean, that speaks a very different story. Yeah. You don't give it to Giuliani political, if you be, don't want hate. He became a political operative at that point. Absolutely, and quite fucking willingly. Once the story blew up, Mac Isaac had to abandon his business in Delaware, wow. go okay. on unemployment, which he claimed in a Fox News interview that I watched on the weekend. This was denied to him as part of a wider conspiracy. Mm. And this, like, watching this interview revealed so much about the mindset of this man. He thinks the Bidens are targeting him through government agencies, which is completely absurd. He thinks that his hat, he's got these ridiculous Scottish hat. He thinks they make liberals upset and that's why he likes wearing them. Like, you're just a child. This guy's a fucking moron. But he's paid dearly. He's basically living in a van down by the river at this point. <laughs> he's in a van down by the river. He's on he's, the government cheese. He's not having a good time. He's not like, having a good time at all. He's been denied government cheese. Uh, uh, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, his appearances on Fox News and right wing media would not be as lucrative. And as he says, quite rightly, his reputation as a technician, like a computer technician, is shot. Like, who's going to trust Mac Isaac with their files? No, that's right. Dude's exactly a right. narc. But not only is he a narc, he'll give your files to fucking political operatives. Mm. So, like, look, in my opinion, he's brought this upon himself. He hasn't got away with this. He hasn't benefited from it. But at the same time, fuck him. He's not a good person. Like I said, everyone in this story is an asshole. While he gave the laptop to the FBI, he also kept a copy of the files, which this paragraph should have been in earlier. And he decided to give this to Rudy Giuliani through his lawyer, Robert Costello. And I like this because Giuliani's a lawyer. Costello's a lawyer. So who's like Costello's lawyer? Does every lawyer have a lawyer? Like <laughs> that's like exponential, isn't it? Like it's lawyerception. Anyway, look, basically- yeah, Never enough lawyers, y'all. Giuliani got the drive, he got really excited, and he set to work digging as much dirt as possible from it, and there's a lot on there, let's face it. It's uh, probably a, a good time to say that the FBI decided after a very, very long time, and they didn't speak to him at all for several several months, um, but then they've decided that there's nothing worth pursuing on it. Not criminally, yeah. No, not criminal stuff. And anyway, not- alongside the images of Hunter Biden posing naked, posing with drugs, and a 12-minute video of him fucking a prostitute while smoking crack, or 29,000 emails with varying degrees of incrimination information. And I say incriminating very lightly here because for the most part, the emails revolved around Hunter Biden using his surname to get jobs, which is not illegal, no. and offering to introduce people to his dad for money, not illegal, not in terms of his father anyway. Yeah. There may be some there may be some legal issues arising from acting as a foreign agent, but yeah. not not for uh, a, a sleepy joke. You know, no. If paying to meet politicians was illegal in the USA, the entire Senate and Congress would be in jail. Yeah, so fundraising. the introduction cool. business is okay, but some of the introductions were done by uh, – were, 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 were mooted at least, were planned – uh, from uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian yeah. business people. Yeah. yeah, and there are implications about going outside borders, but at the end of the day, a lot of these things are quite incidental and low, low, low consequence. Yeah, look, it, 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 he was an unregistered, it may be claimed that he was an unregistered foreign agent or working on behalf of a foreign government yeah. uh, and that he'd not registered, but it doesn't. It doesn't climb on uh, Joe at all. It'd be a he, hard case he, anyway. He was talking about daddy. Um, yeah. I can introduce you to daddy, you know, big yeah, daddy. big daddy, I think it was, something like that. Big it's, daddy, yeah. There's a whole bunch of stuff they dug up, which is just so arbitrary and pointless. So giving the drive to Giuliani was a terrible idea on several levels. But one of those was the fact that he is, Rudy Giuliani, fucking computer illiterate. And clearly yeah. employs idiots of a similar caliber to work for him. The external hard drive he received wasn't cloned or copied to maintain integrity. You take the drive and you immediately clone it and you put that in a fucking safe. But no, they plug the drive in and move files across the drive into folders that were marked for their significance according to like whether the material was incriminating or not. I can't remember the names. I, I, I should have written this down. Something along the lines of like, you know, like... Uh, dirt filer, incriminating. Like, they, they were so yeah. blatant about it. Hunter Biden cock. And, of course, unfortunately, at this situation, that'd be the good folder, the contents of the drive, which are probably legitimate, as far as evidence goes, is dog shit. Yeah. Because it's, the drive's been doctored. And now it's a matter of who you believe, whether it's been put in there, 
Are there Russians involved, as we'll get to later? But the presentation of the materials appears to be manipulated. You fucking Mm. moron. You had this beautiful thing, and you made people able to doubt the contents. It's it's actually a really good point because uh, Giuliani had copies, but other media organisations had copies as well, and Giuliani gives his copy to the New York Post. But um, others uh, are given uh, copies of this thing, and if it was in fact doctored or had been doctored or at least uh, potentially doctored, uh, then maybe it's a get out for some of those mainstream media organisations who ignored it. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll deal with that in a minute. And they milk those get outs pretty hard. I mean, Giuliani goes straight to the New York Post, who he thought was a trustworthy source that wasn't going to spend their time debunking it, which is something along the lines of what he said. Front and they page. began... They the began to publish articles based on the information taken from the laptop. The first stories were regarding Hunter's role at Burisma, the Ukrainian gas company he worked for, Clearly, because his last name was Biden, there's no other reason why a crackhead was on $50,000 a month to be a part of this company. But historically, Joe has tried to keep a distance from Hunter's business dealings, and for very good reason. He's an opportunist and a fucking idiot. He's an absolute liability, and you want nothing to do with being near him. But Hunter managed to introduce Vadim Pozharsky. Pozharsky, yeah. You are much better than this than I am. True professional. To his father in Washington, D.C., and spent some time together, according to emails from the laptop, which they were on like flies on shit. Yeah. It's not a good look, but it doesn't imply Joe sold his uh, time for money. It does imply, very very straightforward way, that Hunter was flogging access to his father, but that doesn't yeah. mean the father was involved. No. It was not an official meeting and simply an incidental unofficial meeting as one would do when your son introduces a mate. They appear to have had dinner there's absolutely no evidence to believe anything nefarious happened there. And this no. was while Joe Biden was um, vice president of the United States Yeah, during the like, Obama administration. There's disinformation, but it's bullshit. A story circulated around what right-wing circles that Joe Biden, who oversaw an anti-corruption investigation as part of his work as vice president under uh, the Obama administration or in the Obama administration, threatened to withhold $1 billion in aid from Ukraine to persuade the government to remove their top prosecutor, Viktor Shokin, from his position. Why? He wasn't prosecuting corrupt government officials. That is mm-hmm. that is the story. The story on right-wing media goes that he demanded this to protect his son from investigation, but Hunter and Burisma, the company for which he was on the board, were not under investigation at all. It was yep. just typical disinformation from the right, you know, the usual shit. They made it up. This is in stark contrast to the phone call between Trump and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, where Trump attempted to withhold $400 million in congressionally approved military aid unless he investigated Hunter Biden in cooperation with Rudy Giuliani and the then Attorney General William Barr, and that was something he was impeached for for the yeah. second time. Yeah. Obviously, Republicans don't see any issue with this while screaming about the idea that that Biden had a corrupt prosecutor taken off the books. Hypocrisy much? Yeah. Biden's story downplaying the meeting between the Burisma exec and himself isn't just the liberal media protecting the Biden crime family. Senate Republicans conducted an investigation and found no wrongdoing by the Bidens, yet the story continues to thrive in disinformation circles. We also mentioned the FBI, who just go, eh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. We've, seen a, we've had a look at this, and it involves no crime. It's ugly, but yeah, it involves It looks no crime. bad, but it's not criminal. The Trump dynasty is full of things that look bad that aren't criminal and things that are, but we'll get to that in another episode. The left have responded to these claims of pay for play with Biden and Burisma by highlighting the $2 billion investment from the Saudi crown prince in a private equity firm started by Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. This is the thing. So whenever pay for play comes up in regard to Hunter Biden's laptop, they mention this. So one tweet with almost 10,000 likes simply says this. Yeah, you say Hunter Biden, we say Jared Kushner and his $2 billion Saudi deal. And this is the thing. The right don't give a shit about Jared Kushner taking $2 billion of the Saudis. They love corruption. It shows business now and gumption. <laughs> They're making deals. Love making deals. The art of yeah. the deal, man. The art of the deal. So what the right can't handle is a sex scandal, which is something very unlikely to come from the Kushner direction. Dude would know a crack pipe for a light bulb, and he's not a sexual creature. Look at the fucking guy. His dick would not be worth taking photos of if you could find it. Yeah, you know, I think you're prejudging there, Joe. Oh, come on. If only Hunter was politically corrupt and Kushner was the crackhead sex addict, now we would have a scandal because that's what <laughs> either side would be wants. 
Would be fruity. That's what they want. As stories came from the New York Post based on the exclusive information found in this juicy hard drive, Facebook took it upon themselves to place a fact check on the article with questions of its validity. And this was met with outrage from the right who saw it as a way to bury the story soon before the 2020 presidential election. It was very, very close. Realistically, the source Mm. of information was dubious and the New York Post have a reputation of being full of shit. So this really wasn't a huge surprise. Well, Twitter decided to go two steps further, blocking users from posting links to the New York Post story entirely. You couldn't even send it in a direct message. Anyone that attempted to share the story was stopped with a message that read, we can't complete this request because this link has been identified by Twitter or our partners as being potentially harmful. Unquote. And existing links posted were tagged that the link may be unsafe, which implies a virus or a security threat. The article was straight up censored. And furthermore, you know, the New York Post, a, a, a media organization, a newspaper, uh, you say, you know, they, they make shit up. It's a tabloid newspaper. And, and at times yeah. they do very good investigative reporting. But they were yeah. shut down by Twitter for about 10 days. Yeah. Twitter claims to hold, the, not, not their journalist, the newspaper was yeah. shut down from Twitter. Uh, yeah. Twitter claims the reason why it was their policy on hacked material. Uh, Twitter policy states directly distributing content obtained through hacking that contains private information will get you banned. This was repeated by Jack Dorsey in front of a Senate hearing led by a complete piece of shit, Ted Cruz, who pressed Dorsey to admit that Twitter was involved in some kind of left-wing propaganda machine. Uh-huh. Dorsey later described the decision to limit the article in such a dr- drastic manner as not great. <laughs> you know, basically, he had so regrets. Casual. The tweet read, our communication around our actions on the NY Post article was not great and blocking URL sharing via tweet or DM with zero context as to why we're blocking it is unacceptable. Mm. And hindsight is twenty yeah. twenty. At the time, the story from the Post was questionable. The The source of the content was questionable, I yeah, would say. Look, uh, I get all that, Joel, but at the same time, this 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 had a high level uh, of um, uh, being in the public interest. Public interest, yeah. A- yeah. And the fact yeah. that New York Post pursued it, I- I've absolutely got no problems with. So the New York Times, probably the most esteemed publish, uh, publication, newspaper publication in the United States uh, and one of those in the world, most and reliable uh, <coughs> reporting and etc. decided not to pursue the story. And in the context, we have to understand the context here because this is in the white heat at the very pointy end of a presidential campaign. They had a copy of that of that hard drive, and maybe they thought it had been that they were they were part of a, they were part of a, you know, a, a deliberate disinformation campaign. That's what they claimed, by the way. They had later. reason to believe it, but at the same time, like I mean, <laughs> which they didn't thinking. bother. They didn't bother checking, and yeah, they and they just dis- uh, just dismissed the story. At the end of the day, the materials weren't hacked, and this is what Not John Paul Isaac says when mm-hmm. those sort of things are brought to him. I would say it was very unethical what he did, but they were voluntarily given away. Yep, alongside the password. Word, what anal fucker 69 yeah, yeah. idiot and then of course this was all given to the computer store contractually after the laptop was technically abandoned for 90 days yep i'm just gonna like put in this little addendum here which is that this only happened because hunter biden is a crackhead and an idiot yep this is all through the story don't forget that but twitter not crackheads not idiots as far as we know restricted the new york post twitter account like we said for 10 odd days or whatever based mm-hmm. on this hacking policy not only that but they also locked the fucking press secretary Kaylee McEnany's account just for sharing the link wow that's yeah. the fucking press secretary of the White House for something yeah. there like on a bit of a hunch might not be legit that's it's- yeah that's that's a bit much <laughs> look uh, yes it yes it definitely is Try and understand the context, though. There was so much misinformation, disinformation, yeah. circling in 2016. I think social media were 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 absolutely uh, uh, belted in the wake of the 2016 election. Yeah, and maybe that was what drove them. It certainly was the wrong call. Don't get me I wrong. Don't, I don't think they the asked enough call. questions. That's and I think thing. it also gives you some sort of motivation about the New York Times as well. Yeah, yeah. So the move itself was blasted as being a partisan move to protect Biden's election chances, this kind of social media, big tech censorship. The Post wrote in an editorial, Facebook and Twitter are not media platforms, they're propaganda machines, which is nice and dystopian, but kind of meaningless. But it was also suggested the laptop was 
a product of Russian disinformation. This is what we've been speaking about, but this is something that really had legs at the time because, as you say, disinformation was rife. It was basically said to be leaked as an attempt to keep their man Trump in the White House because it's in Russia's best interest for that to be the case. He had his own plans by that stage. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Most of the reasoning for this is based on Giuliani's past with Russian actors. This is at least most of the reasoning I've found online. He has an absolute lack of integrity when it comes to electioneering. The guy's got no fucking scruples. But he also has links to Russia in the fact that his work with operators, his work with players over there. So Mm -hmm. the link to Russia was sort of one part speculation, one part wishful thinking, because left-leaning journalists and campaigners were absolutely dreading the idea of a last-minute bombshell to disrupt Biden's presidential chances. That was the main motivation. I don't doubt for a second that a lot of this was politically motivated. And, I mean, fuck Trump, but, I mean, oh, it's hard. In 2016, the campaign was essentially... You know, suspended. You know, just just a week out when yeah. Hillary, Cl- when um, uh, the the former head of the uh, the FBI decided he was going to reinvestigate Hillary Clinton the emails, over her yeah. emails. Yeah, that was fucked up. And and that and that really did just blow the whole campaign up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she made lots of mistakes. Don't get me wrong. It's not just that that she like she. That's not the reason she did the entire reason, but it was certainly one of them. Her first mistake is that she sucks. Yeah, look, furthering the theory that the laptop dump was Russian dis- disinfo, soon after the Post article, over 50 former senior intelligence officials signed onto a letter outlining their belief that the recent disclosure of emails allegedly belonging to Joe Biden's son has all the classic earmarks of a Russian information operation. That's a direct quote. Has all mm-hmm. the classic earmarks of a Russian information operation. 50 former CIA and Intel officials from the United States signed that open letter. Yeah. And that's very compelling, especially when you really don't want it to be true. There was no evidence to their claims. It was just, you know, they got the vibe yeah. about it. Oh, they I said see. their national yeah. security experience had made them deeply suspicious that the Russian government played a significant role in this case and cited several elements of the story that suggested the laptop was a product of the Kremlin. In a quote that aged like milk, they said, if we are right, they added, this is Russia trying to influence how Americans vote in this election, and we believe strongly that Americans need to be aware of this. And they were wrong. They were wrong. And they not only wrong. that, Joel, when it was put to them that they were wrong, they just sort of shrugged their soul and said, yeah, yeah. we still believe we did the right thing. Yeah, but better off for that, Trump, so I don't care. Yeah, ends justifies the means. I mean, the intelligence community must have been shitting themselves with the idea of Trump having another four years. The guy's a fucking psychopath who believes in conspiracy theories. He's so vulnerable to influence from, like, a handful of morons who just make up weird fairy tales where he's the center and the hero, and he fucking believes it because he's a delusional idiot. So, yeah, I mean, like, I get that. It's This this story is full of hidden trolley problems where people, journalists, Twitter, intelligence guys have stood there with that trolley problem thinking if i put the track this way i'm going to interfere with the election but if i put the track this way it might be the end of the republic as we know it so i mean i get it i get it but integrity i don't know it's 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 a tricky philosophical question yeah well those 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 50 uh, more than 50 in uh, former senior intelligence officials i mean the, the their reputations are shot. Yeah. I mean, they're probably mostly retired anyway, so they're probably they just are, there. Pretty much all of them, Scratching yeah. their ass and golf There's some big anyway. names and they still appear on MSNBC and, and all this. They're all retired, but, yeah. yeah, they're prepared to, you know, Doing continue to flog their opinions. Yeah, probably write books and nonsense like that, you know, crochet. So relying on this and seeking comment from experts and being cautious to the point of obscuring any belief that material is legitimate, leading outlets like, as you say, the New York Times and the Washington Post also immediately sought to debunk the emails that were relied upon in the New York Post article and just cast doubt upon the authenticity of the information. One thing they did is they referred to Thomas Reid in the Washington Post article. That's Rapo, yeah. Okay. Who's the author of Active Measures, which is a leading book on disinformation, and he's a bit of a, a voice in the field, who cited a lack of metadata and header information as a reason to doubt the source of the emails. But, I mean, like, I'm just saying this off the cuff, but in reality, I mean, the New York Post isn't going to publish reams of metadata for the sake of expediency. It's just more sexy to have an email without all the fucking headers email yep. headers are long and awful to read it's got all this encryption data it's got all this bullshit in it the new york post knew what they had 
they didn't ha- feel like they had to post all the bloody Google headers with all the DKIM and SPF fucking The difference code. between the New York Times and the Washington Post in terms of, you know, um, um, blame at least was that WAPO didn't have a copy of the hard drive. Yeah, yeah, fair. Um, yeah, but the fair. New York Times did and just went, nah. Yeah. Anyway, the Washington Post originally published their article on the laptop on October 14, 2020 with a clear attempt to debunk the information. Yeah. On March 30, 2022, the Washington Post updated the article, that's, you know, 18 months later, to say that some of the data on the portable drive appears to be authentic. Yeah, Mm. some of it. They didn't have a copy of it, but they sought to debunk it. Anyway, experts that analysed the drive concluded that nearly 22,000 emails among those files carried cryptographic signatures that could be verified using technology that would be difficult for even the most sophisticated hackers to fake. So yeah, they've sort of that's their apology. Right? That's your head. Yeah, that really is their apology. I was looking for an apology or some kind of mea culpa and I just didn't fucking find it. Which well, I New York Times one's really hard to find too, mate. Really I, hard I, to I find. I was looking. I was looking. So look, the article uses the mishandling of data as a reason to doubt the authenticity of the contents. It's such a get out of jail free card. But the mm. shuffling of the files we mentioned earlier around the drive, putting it in these folders with blatant like ideologically driven names, like bad folder, blah, blah, blah. It's like, mate, like it just, it totally obfuscates the origin of these files. But on the emails, it's a lot easier to know the source because the Google metadata in these emails are intact. Yeah. But like later on, Mac Isaac claimed in a Mediaite article, I don't really know Mediaite. It's a, I guess it's a publication of some variety. Uh, it's it's like a sort of rolling blog. Okay. And see, this is something that I saw that was actually uh, posted by Twitter accounts that had very bot-like style of posting. Once again, Ed Coper has broken me and now I see everyone as a bot. But at the same time, they were posting this in a very methodical way across any tweet I found regarding Hunter Biden's laptop. But that being aside, he has said on the record that he believes that material has been inserted into the laptop after it left his custody. And he's quoted as saying, that is a major concern of mine because I have fought tooth and nail to protect the integrity of this drive. Mm. But the thing is, is like all this integrity talk about emails and Burisma and blah, blah, blah. You know what it comes down to? The photos of Hunter Biden smoking crack, rooting prostitutes, and being a cooked idiot in general, making selfies of himself smoking crack, they're real. That's the, that's the money stuff. That's the front page. Yeah. It should be. It's so funny that the right is so fixated on trying to catch him doing corruption when it's like, dude, he's rooting prostitutes. But of course, us satanic lefties don't care about that sort of stuff. But why do I think they're real? Okay, I'm just going to level with you. And I know, I'm sorry, Jack, we're going back to it. Oh, no. Why would they give him such a giant cock? <laughs> Hunter has an amazing penis. He's totally packing heat. All right, Joe. All Not right. since the aptly named Anthony Weiner have we seen such a majestic Democrat penis just laid out on display for all of us to see. And while I find it absolutely bizarre that Hunter found it a good idea to take photos of himself so he can crack, I can absolutely see why he took a bunch of dick pics because he has a great penis. Mm. I'd probably have it framed on my wall. <laughs> All right. Okay. But alongside his Majestic Johnson, and I know you don't like to, to dwell on certain yeah. topics, I think it deserves reverence and respect. The other photos aren't quite as glamorous. The dude loved a selfie, including one with his withered, crack-affected teeth before getting a new set of clearly fake chompers. It is harrowing. They are these little, pointy, tiny mm. tooth stumps. It's fucking mm. disgusting. The contents of the laptop are salacious to say the very least. I mean, crack smoking and sex is a huge scoop. The problem is, as I said before, man, the left, we're like, we are degenerates. We're de- demonic sex perverts. We love this shit. If anything, we're just impressed. We like sex and drugs. What we don't like is corruption. So, of course, the first email, the first post, the first article is always going to be about some kind of pay for play bullshit with this treasure trove of actual smut and filth which would make Hunter S. Thompson wince, that's not a smoking gun to them. Because us demonic lefties, we're just sitting there thinking, fuck, we should hang out with Hunter. He's cool. Uh, But it was going to go further and cue the child porn accusations. Now, I don't need to explain the obsession with child porn on the right side of politics, but it goes without saying that images and footage supposedly lifted off the laptop 
would be labelled as kiddie porn. Everyone they disagreed with is a pedophile and Hunter Biden was about to join the ranks. Oh, yeah. and claims on social media circulated that Hunter Biden had 25,000 pictures of him raping and torturing children under the age of 10 in China on his laptop. Yep. Let's just think about that and, and what the owner of the uh, Delaware store would have been required to do had he seen those images. So true. So that's why you know it's not true. It's just bullshit. Right. Facebook tagged them as being disinformation, but that's simply a badge of honour to these people. The claim, of course, appears to have originated from child porn, cesspit, 4chan, pot, kettle, black. A right-wing media claimed the investigator that subpoenaed the laptop as a top child porn investigator due to his experience with digital forensics investigating cases of child abuse. This association is made to insinuate that Hunter Biden has child pornography on his laptop. It's just pure fucking disinformation. Fox News Mario Bartiromo asked Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson, connect the dots. If an FBI agent is working on child pornography issues for five years, why is he subpoenaing the laptop of Hunter Biden? Is there a connection here? Johnson answered with, well, I think you just made the connection, he said. Again, this is what the FBI, I think, has to come clean about. Come clean about what? The police yeah. who work in digital forensics have worked on child pornography cases. This is obviously bullshit, but here we are. Yeah, I mean, like, it's just, it's it's fog of war disinformation. But another absolute perler of disinformation tied to the laptop which I still see peppered around Telegram and I'm browsing for right-wing trash because they just throw it in unannounced with no context at all the time, yeah. is Malia Obama's black platinum credit card next to a few lines of cocaine. Yeah, I know this one. Snopes and other outlets have claimed the card was somehow stolen by hackers, and they're so vague about it by using that language, but I'm guessing this means they either stole her identity or attempted to make a card with her name on it to create uh, some sort of piece of Probably salacious disinformation. Mm. It's hard to say the idea of hackers stole. Like, what the fuck do they even mean? The card claims she's been a card holder since 2011. She was 13. <laughs> Most card companies don't let 13-year-olds hold credit cards. Generally not, yes. I mean, either way, it's clearly bullshit. I mean, like, there's just, it, just no. And furthering the whole Obama daughter's angle, a black woman is seen face down naked in laptop pictures. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy circles decided the girl was in fact Malia Obama. It's just awful, isn't it? She's a young woman. I know. It's disgusting. These people are fucking filthy people. And this is the thing. So they have these like really ridiculous correlation of body features like moles and freckles and shit. Most of them didn't even line up. They don't even work, but it doesn't have to be good. It doesn't need to be true. It just needs to be compelling. It needs to tell people what they want to hear. And then, of course, right-wing idiots will lap up the story and share it like wildfire. But since Hunter Biden's laptop, 4chan managed to break into his iCloud and download his iPhone backup. That happened like maybe two weeks ago. And this is kind of what prompted this because I want to cover that, but I had to cover this first. A whole new raft of text, images, and video, including footage of Hunter measuring crack in a hotel with yet another hooker he's had like heaps, and bizarre names for various contacts in his phone, which are interesting. While it has become another cesspool of disinformation and manipulated images, implying Hunter Biden is a child sex offender and other dumb claims, it has given right-wing hacks and conspiracy circles another huge data dump to work through, sifting through the morass to find a whole new conspiracy universe around Hunter Biden's crackhead adventures, which, without lying, are pretty saucy. But just like the cheese pizza and the walnut sauce and the Podest emails, we're about to see a whole new set of bullshit random claims of coded language and blah, blah, go. blah from our good friends at 4chan. And, of course, a lazy Hunter Biden who doesn't change his passwords, has dumb passwords like <laughs> anal fucker 69 no 2FA. Get your shit together, you fucking loser. Your dad's a president. But in all of this, it has to be said that Hunter Biden does not hold that office. His nope. dad does. He doesn't plan to hold office. He's not a candidate. The examples of access he's given to his father, to various people he works with, have been fleeting and inconsequential. Hunter has, however, used his family name to make millions, abs- actual millions of dollars, promising people wild benefits in emails that have been dug up through these leaks in exchange for basically having him on their boards and their payrolls. He's an entitled little shit with a giant penis and a horrible narcissistic personality, but a great penis. I'm just going to say it here. In summary, everyone in this story sucks. There's no heroes, only villains. Mac Isaac sucks. Giuliani sucks. The New York Post sucks. The New York Times sucks. Hunter Biden sucks. 
I think all of these people have their own part in being lying shitbags throughout this entire thing. Well, I'm going to say, I'm just going to come out with a little bit of a, a speculator, and I think Giuliani would be, be in jail before Hunter. Ooh, I like it. I like it. And Giuliani doesn't have a lot of gold in years to uh, to experience, so yeah. he'd probably die in there. He's not even doing those late night ads anymore. Oh, bless. Maybe he starts selling pillows soon. But this is the thing. The most important part of this story has been truth and it is the one thing every single fucking one of those people involved in this ridiculous saga have just absolutely failed to grasp. Once again, Pete has failed to deliver the goods this week, ba-bow, and present no, me with something truly Pete. worth laughing about. You're just not funny. You're just sad no, and weird and funny. angry. It's boring, Pete. Just shit. Just blah. He did make a Telegram post about how he's aging so gracefully and will be surfing till he's 100, but honestly, I think there's a melanoma or two that might get in the way of his plans. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. We'll I don't see. know. We'll see. We'll I'm not see. a doctor, but yeah, just yeah. too much confidence. Yeah. Baseless. Baseless. Zippy Babbitt, on the other hand, has been consistently funny. He's there. He, he has not been idle. This episode is a monster, by the way, so I'm just keeping our Dijon title segment really short and sweet because I'm just going to let him speak for himself. This is his beautiful, beautiful tweet. He was so proud of this tweet, he, he pinned it to the top of his feed. Either that or it was an accident. I'm yeah. not sure. You know, Finger clumsy slip. fingers and all. Yeah. He goes, our shrine of remembrance is a place where we pay tribute to our fallen heroes who fought and died for the values we hold dear. It is not a place for political virtue signalling the end. Oh, sorry, are you talking about the Mauritian Foreign heroes or the Australian <laughs> foreign heroes there, Zipster? He's a 10 out of 10 patriot. Actually, he's 11 out of 10 now. Yeah, he got the, got the, he's, he's gone nuts on Twitter. He's got the hashtag Shrine Virtue Signaling Respect Our Soldiers. Again, Mauritian or, okay. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll work that out. Well, I mean, look, we've discussed the Shrine at length this episode. So we're going to kind of leave it there. I just think the words speak for themselves. But- <laughs> Just saying, he's proud of that tweet. It has the depth of a five-year-old. He loves it. What's mm. political about war memorials? I mean, Ralph would ask his equally confused brother, who would sit in confused silence for two minutes, staring at a wall, and then conclude, "There's nothing political about war memorials." <laughs> Even with that aside, you know what isn't political? Being gay. It's a sexual preference. It's not a political stance. It's not something you decide. It's something you're born with. So the idea of homosexuality being political is something that he's inserting in the conversation, not the gays. This man is a fucking moron. Six years. We have six years of this to look forward to. So in a beautiful example of just incidental poetry, Babs came out with this conspiratorial brain fart. Oh, this is good. Fear is a tool of control. Perpetual fear, crisis after crisis, emergency after emergency. It's a technique as old as time itself. Immediately following is this retweet from Jim Mullen. For the first time in 80 years, war on our doorstep is not just possible, it's likely. So what is China's end game? How might the war start? What would war with China look like and what should Australia do? Extract of my new book, Danger on Our Doorstep, in today's Daily Telegraph. Fear, 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 perpetual fear, crisis after crisis, yep. emergency after emergency. But I'll tell you what, all those things, absolutely worth a retweet. I mean, he's part yeah. of the system now, right? Now <laughs> he's, he's in, actually got to use fear as a tool fear, of control. He's in the fear business, He's Joe. in the fear business, and business is good. And you have been listening to the Condition Release Program with your hosts, Jack the Insider and Joel Hill. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. And if you've enjoyed our bullshit, throw us a five-star review on your podcast app. Jack can be found on Twitter on at Jack the Insider and Joel on at Crunchy Moses with a K. We have also set up a Facebook page you can find fairly easily. We have really great threads and chats. It's, it's worth jump, jumping onto. But promoting a podcast, easy said than done. Each week, I yell at you to share. This time, I'm going to be nice to you because we've reached 101. We've got a great listener base. Lots of shares, yes, If you lots make of it shares. bigger, it just, it just helps us. Because, yeah, you know, shares we still get people last week. coming in saying, oh, I've been following Cookers for so long and I've only just heard of you. I'm yeah, like, so why? How have you only just heard of us now? Fuck, we've been going for two years. <laughs> Yeah, and the Patreon is up and running, and we yes, ask listeners to consider throwing a few dollars our way. Yeah, for as little as five dollars a month, access to all sorts bonus content. If you give us even more money, you get a whole bunch of other benefits. You can even watch us record the show. But if we get to a thousand patrons, I promise I'll change my name to Joel of the House Hill, and Jack. <laughs> yeah, you're on the you're on the hook for this. Peter of the House Hoisted yeah. will knock over a petrol station so we can get into a courtroom, and we'll just just tell them that it wasn't us; it was our Gobble flesh, fleshly bodies. It was. It was. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know. It wasn't us. 
It was it was our fleshly bodies to blame. Yeah, it was our fleshly bodies, and uh, yeah. and then uh, and you know, but like just give us some money. Yeah, look, listeners, we love the grift. It's just we're not as good at as as the cookers are. You know, help us. We're morally conflicted. Yeah, I'm not morally conflicted in in any way, shape, or form. I'm actually going to try and sell the Trumps and mausoleum, but it's just made of Bitcoin. Don't bury <laughs> your loved ones. Just put them on the blockchain, bro. <laughs> and finally, all feedback, tips, and death threats should be sent to the conditional release program at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you, even if it's to tell us that you've got. Got a few water damage max to leave with us. Just make sure to leave the pictures of your dick on the desktop and we will sell them to RV Yemeni in exchange for T-shirts with press written on them. That's how I become a journalist. Finally, <laughs> I made it. I made it into the upper class. <laughs> got to have that T-shirt. They got to have Thanks, the T-shirt. Thanks, listeners. Thanks, See ya. Guys. See ya. I don't think I ever want to talk to any of those people. Fuck me, you guys are bastards.